Let's talk about court packing for a minute. Yes. One of the reasons court packing concerns me, one of the many reasons, is because it's not prohibited in the first instance. It's not prohibited by the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that Congress uh, may not change the size of the Supreme Court. There's no limitation on that. We have, uh, for 152 years, stuck with the number nine. It, it has worked, uh, and in the absence of an argument saying that that number is too, is too uh, uh, low, that the court is too small, uh, from a workforce standpoint, we need to expand it. It's difficult to imagine uh, why it would be a good idea to change it, particularly because if you increase the size of the court, in, in one fell swoop, swoop and you, you uh, do that for partisan political purposes, allowing one president, the current president, to have a disproportionate Im impact on the court and to change its rulings, the, that portion of the court's docket that tends to be more politically contentious. It can turn the court into a, a political football of sorts. Given the, the fact that our Supreme Court justices uh, uh, serve for life, uh, the, once you do that, it, it becomes something of a one-way ratchet, always expanding, never contracting. Before long, you could see an increasingly larger court, with the court expanding each time a different party secures the coveted circumstance of a majority in the House, majority in the Senate, and uh, controlled by the same party of the White House. And so this is why it concerns me. I understand that, why it is that uh, the, the canons of judicial ethics don't allow you to comment on matters that might come before you. This is one that could not come before you as a justice. This is a non-justiciable political question. It's committed to the two political branches of government. There's not even a constitutional challenge that could lie to it, even though it's, it would undermine the separation of powers in the Constitution, as I see it. It's, it's not unconstitutional. So it couldn't and it would never come before you. Uh, Last night when you were asked a question by my colleague, uh, uh, Senator Kennedy, on this, you acknowledged that you have an opinion. Did I understand that right? You have an opinion on court packing? Senator, I have a lot of opinions. I have opinions on, on I'm a human being, uh, and I have an opinion on a lot of things. The reason why, um, in my view, it is not appropriate for me to comment is because of my fidelity to the judicial role. I understand that it's a political question and that is precisely why I think that I am uncomfortable speaking to it. No, I, I understand that and I, and I respect, uh, respect the impulse. I, I respect the, the overall um, issue and I think it's, it's better for Article Three judges and justices ordinarily to not wade into the political thicket. This one I do think is different because number one, as I say, it can never come before you. Number two, it does have an impact on what you would be doing, and you also, as an Article III judge, someone who's served for nearly nine years as a federal judge, you've developed experience and intuition and uh, a thorough understanding of our federal court system, and that's why I think your perspective on it would be valuable. The reason it concerns me so much is that even when court packing doesn't succeed legislatively, it can leave an impact. The last time this was attempted was in 1937. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was upset at the Supreme Court on a number of, of bases. He didn't like uh, the uh, then 32-year-old precedent of Lochner versus New York, where the, the five conservatives on the Supreme Court engaged in an act of judicial activism, reading something into the Constitution that wasn't really there. Some people disagree with me on this, but I, it wasn't there. And they imposed that. But the bigger reason was he didn't like the court's interpretation of the Commerce Clause. It was that interpretation of the Commerce Clause, the one we discussed yesterday, you know. Uh, prior to 1937, you, you, you had uh, the Supreme Court ag agreeing as far as the channels and instrumentalities of interstate commerce that we talked about yesterday. You had the court more or less in agreement over time as to the impact of the Dormant Commerce Clause. But as to the substantial effects test, that didn't exist yet. It required something much closer to an interstate commercial transaction uh, in order for commerce, com Congress's Commerce Clause authority to kick in. There were the, uh, the so-called four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, as FDR affectionately called them, uh, four conservatives who were consistently 
uh, pushing uh, for limits on Congress's authority. And then you had other justices who would sometimes join with them. Usually that included Justice Owen Roberts, who had stood with them in maintaining narrower authority for Congress under the Commerce Clause. All that changed went on April 12th, 1937, two weeks to the day when the, the, the case often associated with the so-called switch in time that changed nine, the West Coast Hotel versus Parrish, uh, where they undid the Lochner precedent. April 12, 1937, the Supreme Court decided a case, NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steele, that forever changed and magnified, expanded the Commerce Clause in a way that had it been through a constitutional amendment, it would be among the most significant, impactful constitutional amendments ever adopted, and yet it's rarely discussed. This, this case resulted from one vote, one person on the Supreme Court who changed his vote, Associate Justice Owen Roberts. It's widely believed, and I believe it, based on what I've researched on it, he was influenced heavily by FDR's court packing plan. He didn't want to be on a court that was packed. He didn't want, he, he convinced himself that he made that switch in order to save the court as it was. And that has changed everything. It's, it's led to a much bigger, more expensive, more intrusive, intrusive federal government. We can disagree as to the policy merits of that, but it did change the Constitution. That's why I worry about that. So I, I hope, I understand you don't want to answer it. I hope that uh, between now and the end of the day, you'll see fit to, to tell us what your opinion is. I do think it's, it's worth, worth discussing.